free agent stuff. Philadelphia 76ers. Yoo-hoo, hello, off-season sort of important. LeBron available. They've disappeared. People are talking about Cleveland. They're talking about the Lakers. They're talking about the Rockets. They're talking about the Spurs. They're talking about the Thunder. They're talking about the Celtics. We're, we're, Philadelphia, you, you do get that Kawhi Leonard may not be available again on the open market. Paul George may not be available again in the open market. Um, Le- LeBron's out there uh, available. So so where is Ben Simmons? Anybody seen Ben Simmons? Oh, we've got a picture of him. He's dating Kendall Jenner. Okay, good to see he's not distracted. Anybody seen Joel Embiid this offseason? And we have multiple pieces of video. He's playing pickup basketball at parks against, like, landscapers and mailmen. And to their general manager, oh, they don't have one. And their brand, well, 10 teams have won a title in 35 years. They're not one of them. By the way, what would you say? Oh, Dario Saric, by the way, where's he at? Is he recruit? Oh, oh, he went back to Croatia. Oh, okay. It's a fun country, but. Yeah, what do I always say about the NBA? It is a man's league. Not a kid's league. Kids have talent. It's a man's league. Ben Simmons, I know about his dating life. Joel Embiid. I know about his pickup basketball life. Dario Saric, not in the country. They don't have a GM. And LeBron, Kawhi Leonard, and Paul George are available. Hello. Yoo-hoo. Anybody home? This is sort of an important offseason. I'm getting every player in the NBA mentioned. Uh, Danny Ainge, by the way, is working the phones. Danny Ainge makes sure he leaks stories to, to let everybody know. Kawhi Leonard, we're interested Philadelphia, it's the best offseason ever. This year, next year, best offseason ever. You're not going to be good enough to compete for a title here with Boston, Golden State, Houston, Lakers. Forget the Timberwolves. Forget the Anthony Davis's Pelicans. You got to pay attention. It's a man's league, not a kid's league. You guys got to be on the phone recruiting people. I want to hear about those stories. And with that, I got to be honest, uh, uh, as I talk about Philadelphia, my next guest live via the Coward Global Satellite Network is Dak Prescott. You know, Dak, you could say anything right here you want about Philadelphia, any team in Philadelphia. Go ahead, say anything you want about anything in Philadelphia. <laughs> Don't have much to say. <laughs> Smart young man. You know, it's funny. I talk about being a man's league and not a kid's league. I got I to gotta eat some crow here. When you were coming out of college, I said, and it's been all over the Internet, I said, he reminds me of a better version. He's a better version of Tebow. I think he'd be a hell of a tight end in the NFL. Well, you obviously were great. And uh, did you, I just want to throw this out there. Did you ever hear that? Because I have taken more crap for that comment in my career than any. Did you even hear loud mouse like me saying, this guy's not going to make it? Yeah, somehow I usually uh, don't listen to much uh, loud mouths or, or you guys, you guys say, but uh, somehow I did hear that one. But I, but I say uh, thank you. You're giving credit to my athletic ability, so I appreciate it. You know, it's interesting. Um, I really think this team has a ch- – I called you guys a dark horse Super Bowl team, and I called you about a month ago. Now, last year at this time, Dak, I called the Philadelphia Eagles a dark horse Super Bowl team. I like this team. I think you've upgraded your pass rushers. Uh, you've upgraded your linebackers. Um, I like this club, and I like your offensive personnel. I do wonder about Jason Witten, though, Dak. He has been your security blanket. He may have the best hands of any tight end in the history of the game. How will you not miss him on those third downs? Uh, he'll be missed. Uh, somebody like Jason Witten is isn't a guy that you can uh, just come in and try to replace. Uh, Jason Witten's a guy that meant a lot to our team on the field and off the field, uh, in the locker room, so... Um, his leadership will be missed, uh, but we, we've we've taken it we've taken it amongst ourselves, our, the young leaders and the veterans on the team, to to be more vocal and to step up and to be better leaders. And then on third down or on the field, we have guys that have made plays uh, on different teams in the NFL, and there's some on the Cowboys. Uh, guys, Cole Beasley, uh, Cole Beasley, Allen Hearns, uh, those guys, Tavon Austin, they'll be able to make those plays, and uh, we're excited for the team. Like you, like you said, the team we have. It's interesting. The thing that blew me away about you from day one, you were never overwhelmed. Forget the fact you were a rookie. You were a quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. 
and you were so cool and so confident and off the field. Every time they put a microphone in your face, you always said the right thing. Now we're a couple years removed from that. When you looked so calm and cool as a rookie, were you? Did you ever feel overwhelmed when you were a rookie looking back on it? No, I didn't. Uh, I was prepared, and I give credit to my teammates, uh, my college coaches for preparing me uh, for the NFL game. And then and then my coaches uh, on the Cowboys have just always made sure I was prepared, I was ready for whatever the game threw at me. Uh, then off the field, it was all new. Uh, it was all exciting. It was something I embraced uh, that – I'd rather I'd rather have the microphone in my face with something good than something bad. So I just embraced it. I just tried to make make the most of uh, most of it. When you step to the line today at practice, how do you see things differently than three years ago? Explain to my audience the growth, how you see the field, how it's easier now, and why it's easier. Yeah, now going into year three, uh, just getting done with the mini camp and OTAs, and you line up against the defense. Uh, certain things and certain looks just like jump out at me. Like I, I see it clear and I see it quick where uh, three years ago, you're, you're looking for those things. You're searching for those things. You're looking for the, the tendencies in the, in the backers if they're blitzing or them off levels and things like that where now when I break the huddle and I go to the line, it's like some of the first things I notice when I look at the defense, they're off levels or the safety's leaning that way, he's trying to disguise. And uh, all that's going to do is allow me to just to play ahead of the game and just be better. You know, You said something about a month ago, and I totally agreed with it, and I thought it was a mature thing to say. You said, listen, man, this whole thing about having a dominant number one receiver, I don't necessarily think that's a necessity, which I completely, absolutely agree with, and I've been saying it for years. Some people were like, whoa, it was a shot at Dez. Could I make this argument that when you have an Odell Beckham, when you have a Julio Jones, when you have Antonio Brown, when you have a Dez, that sometimes as a quarterback, Dak, you almost feel that you have to go to him. You feel like, you know what, man, I got to get his touches in. And that when you don't have that now, that you walk to the line without that pressure on your shoulders. Could I make an argument that Dez sometimes forced you going to the line to look his way when maybe he wasn't necessarily a target? I wouldn't say necessarily forced me, but um, in your defense of what you're saying, yeah, when you have those those players like that, those receivers, the Dodell Beckham's, Antonio Browns, um, I mean, Des Bryant, you want to get them the ball because of what, what they've done in the past with the ball in their hand, where whether if it's going to make that tough catch or where if it's getting it on a slant and breaking tackles or whatever it may be, you want to get the ball in the hand. So, I mean, it's just one of those deals that when you don't have a big-time guy or the number one or whatever you want to call those guys, uh, you go out there and just spread the ball around. And it's, it's not a factor even in your head who gets a catch, who, who has – how many touches? Uh, some of my best games in the NFL have been with eight different targets or so. So yeah, uh, we'll head it. We'll head into the season with the uh, with the mirage of guys and uh, be excited for what we have. Two years ago, he was the offensive rookie of the year, despite being drafted in the fourth round. And some radio idiot called him a tight end. Oh wait, that was me. Um, how do you? You're the Cowboy quarterback. There's phones everywhere, but you have a life and you have a right to a life. And you've never shown me any reason to be concerned in the NFL. When you go out now, nightclub, friends, teammates, are you sometimes ap- apprehensive, anxious? Oh my God, I'll be on, I'm a cowboy quarterback. Do you feel sometimes like you live in a fishbowl in Dallas and that you can't go out? Uh, yeah, I mean, not just Dallas, um, but other cities as well. Um, definitely sports cities, but it's just about being smart. It's about knowing that there's that opportunity for the the camera to come out. There's that opportunity for something bad to happen. So it's about putting myself in the right situations, um, eliminating all those distractions or things that may could uh, cause a spiral downhill and and be in the the news for something bad that I just try to eliminate them, all aspects of it, and uh, just be the best. Finally, listen, Zeke is amazing. He's had some maturity issues. Do you feel it's your responsibility now that you're in your third year that if he has a little stumble, it's your responsibility to go talk to him and address it. Yeah, I mean, he won't. Uh, he's a grown man, too. Uh, it's not any man's responsibility to check on another grown man, but Zeke is a guy that's grown so much just in the uh, th- three years he's been in the NFL and the three years that I've known him on the field and off the field. So um, I'm not too worried about Zeke. Uh, he's not somebody that, I, that I'm always checking on or calling. Uh, he's, a, he's a professional. He's definitely taken the steps and the strides that he's needed to. 
uh, to be the to be the professional on and off the field that will that'll make it a long time in this league. Well, Carson Wentz is in your division. Giants upgraded on offense. Alex Smith in your division. The NFC is loaded. It is going to be an incredible season for you and the NFC, Fox, and the Cowboys. You are here on behalf of Ready, Raise, Rise, a fight against cancer. Always been a good dude. What is that? Yeah, Ready, Raise, Rise. I'm teaming up with Bristol Myers Squibb for the second second year in a row. And the Ready, Raise, Rise campaign is just about bringing awareness and uh, educa- educating people on the immuno-oncology research. Uh, and it's focusing on the uniqueness in cancer and in people's different and different people's cancer. And not only that, just help about how it can help your immune system fight off cancer within the body. Uh, and it's something that, that I'm blessed to be able to to be able to be a part of and be on this team, just know my, uh, everyone knows my story with my mom. Um, it's, it's powerful and it's unique. And that brings me to our challenge. We're challenging everyone out there uh, to go to readyraiserise.com, um, click the pick your power link on there and, and submit a photo, a photo of you with the Ready Raise Rise sign and basically showing us how unique and how powerful you are dealing with cancer, not dealing with cancer, being healthy, whatever it may be. Uh, but so we can, um, raise money, and we can raise a lot of money and educate people on the immuno-oncology research. Uh, in doing so, once we get to 100 photos, Bristol Myers Squibb has promised to donate a quarter of a million dollars to cancer advocacy groups, so it's a must. Hey, by the way, you'd still be a really good tight end in the NFL, but, but you're also <laughs> a great quarterback, but you could have been a great tight end. I'm just That's all I'm saying, Dak. I appreciate that. I'll keep that in my back pocket. <laughs> all right, Dak. Thanks, man. Uh, Thank you, Colin. All right. Take care. Can't wait for the season. Joy Taylor with the news. No, 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 no. Turn on the news. This is the Herdline News. All right, so, Colin, we talked yesterday about Tom Brady and Oprah and him possibly seeing the end of his career. So the yeah. conversation continues. Well, yesterday, Tom Brady responded to an ESPN social media post on Instagram. The post said, Tom Brady says he's still motivated to keep playing, but he knows he can't play forever. Well, Brady commented on it with, quote, 45, which means 45 in Spanish. 45, yeah. Um, with the see no evil, hear no evil, evil, or speak no evil emojis. So, uh, you know, Tom, he's he's like, he's with Giselle. You know, they're, they're into, like, the earth and energy yes. and, you know, like, Costa law of Rica. attraction and, like, yeah. you know, di- di- all that different stuff. So I looked it up. So maybe 45 doesn't necessarily mean he wants to retire at 45. Oh. You know, Tom doesn't really like to put, you know, boundaries on himself. So 45 also represents an angel, uh, and it means a call from your guardian angels to pursue your passions. So maybe oh. he's being, like, very vague, you know? That is that is very smart. I had not considered that. I just yeah. went right to the age thing. I know. You know, you have to think bigger with yeah. Tom Brady. Because no, he, is, he is really the centerpiece of our world. <laughs> Well, actually, it also means that you are a, quote, light worker called to help all of humanity. So, you know, what's more important than winning Super Bowls, really? Very when you interesting. Of humanity, you know, you got you to think outside the box with Tom sure. Brady. Uh, more quarterback talk. Whenever the uh, Packers first drafted Aaron Rodgers, it was a big deal that Brett Favre said it wasn't his job to train Aaron Rodgers. Well, Brett Favre said he spoke with Rodgers recently, and now that he is older, he understands what Favre was saying. Let's take a listen. We talked about that. He said, you know, I get it now. I get what you were saying or, you know, how you carried yourself. And there is no call that says, hey, you groom the next guy to take your job or else. That doesn't work that way. If I do anything, I'm going to get you a phone that works. We kind of chuckle. That, that guy, <laughs> is, is, it, it may be the worst at returning messages. Being the Packer quarterback and following Favre has never been easy. I think it's a lot heavier weight than people get. I, Far, Far was not only great, he's the most popular NFL player, I think, in my life. He's more more popular than Joe Montana and Tom Brady, and I think he's a little bit more popular than Peyton Manning. You never want to be the guy that replaces guy. Yeah. You you, you want to you want a little space in between there. Yeah. So David Lee really Roth. Appreciate you. David Lee Roth followed Howard Stern. That didn't work out. You want to be the guy that replaces David Lee Roth, then you got a better chance. I don't blame guys for not wanting to quote groom their replacement. Oh, I totally get that. But this idea that like Big Ben was all all in the headlines recently over Mason Rudolph. And like you said yesterday, there's no love in business. So I get it. But what what kind of what kind of like secret message or thing are you possibly going to pass on that he's all of a sudden going to be like, "Oh, and now take your job." Listen, if you're like replacing- he's either good enough to 
to replace you or he's not. That's right. You have to have an it factor. If you're replacing a legend, you have to have it. And it encompasses the emotional strength, the physical strength, the confidence. And Aaron's got it. So it works. But that, man, it's, it's, I, I've never believed in grooming your successor. You know what I tell young radio people? I say, be lazy. Don't do your homework. <laughs> have no sources. That's the key to this job. <laughs> I want to. That's that's why I tell Doug Gottlieb talk hockey all day. <laughs> why would I want to have somebody replace me? I tell him all the opposite thing. Be terrible to management. Go on Twitter and talk about politics all day long, kids. That's the key to success. It's very petty, Colin. I like it. <laughs> Finally, we talked about Kawhi Leonard meeting with Greg Popovich in uh, in Cali, and according to reports, very shocking reports, Colin. Kawhi is still really set over Tony Parker's critical comments when he mentioned uh, oh, dismay over how long. That's come out now. Kawhi. Oh, has, so that's yes. now that's official now. It's official. Okay. Th it's official. Kawhi didn't like his teammate talking about his injury. What I know you... it's groundbreaking, <laughs> but so it's public now. It is public. Okay, now. there you go. That's what we said. Of course he does. Who wants a coworker? you know, tagging him in the media. Well, it's more than a coworker. Every injury is not the same. You know, we, we talk about injuries all the time, and obviously they have lasting effects on franchises and change the course of sports history. Yeah. But there's no way for you to say, oh, I had the same injury, so it this is how long it takes to recover. Everyone recovers differently. Right. And more importantly, I, I mean, I, I don't... I'm, I don't have the information in front of me, but Kawhi does have a super max contract and did just watch Isaiah Thomas leave millions and millions of dollars on the table for a franchise and then get traded. So there maybe you he just wanted to wait until the season was over and he had his options and leverage. So who yeah. knows? Joy Taylor with the news. Well, that's the news. And thanks for stopping by. The Herd Line News. You know,